is three down to zero, or three down to two. So I'm not sure if this makes sense, but basically it's uh, we have four, three, two, one, zero. So this is the select switch. This is input two. This is input one. And, then, and yes, I think that's it. So to compile, you can either go here and you can say uh, yes. Uh, also need to add. I forgot. I was going to uh, put the switch inputs to the red LEDs. What the heck is going on here? Oh yeah, obviously um, I don't have a condition here for some reason. I was thinking that this was already else, and then uh, this is still wrong too. Okay, so you can see compilation was successful. Uh, one thing I forgot to do though, it's pretty important. Uh, this was something I talked about in my first lesson video, but um, in uh, first bindings, there's something called the user constraints file, which uh, basically maps uh, the pins on your FPGA to the peripherals on your board. And Altera has similar things. Uh, it's for, uh, it's called a, I think it's called a QSF file, and it does the same exact thing. It just tells Cordis, um, because Cordis just deals with your FPGA, it doesn't know what your development board is. So you need the QSF file to tell uh, Cordis what switches specifically pin-wise and LDG or uh, the LED red and green LEDs. It doesn't know where those are mapped to on what pin. So uh, let me find that for a second. Uh, keep forgetting where that is. I have the DE2. This board is, the board that I have is directly from Altera, so I think I can find it from here. But if you got your board, if you got your development board from somewhere else, then you need to get the, the QSF file from uh, that that supplier that uh, sold you that board. But in this case, Altera made the development board that I'm using, so that's why I'm looking on Altera's website. Uh, here's it. This is the board. It usually has it on the product page. Okay, so here it is. Um, see it's at the bottom of this page. So the cord is setting file with 10 assignments. Uh, okay, so this is what it looks like if you expand it. And I'm just gonna explore this really quick. So if you look up SW for switches, you see it's got all these switches here. It has the seven, I have 18 switches on this board. That's why it shows all these switches. And so, um, and this is the pins on the FPGA that this is connected to. So what this file does is it just tells Cordis, this pin is switch zero. So if the developer, if the developer mentions switch zero, then that means they want to use this pin. So here you go back, save link. Okay, so now I got that. Um, so what you need to do in order to incorporate that QSF is go to assignments, import assignments, uh, and grab that guy. Okay. And now all this went uh, question mark again because you need to compile it with this netlist in mind. We'll start over. Okay, so it compiled successfully. All that's left now is to flash it to uh, the development board. So we use program device. Um, uh, hardware setup. Mm. I don't know why it's not appearing here. Uh, here you should be seeing the USB um, blaster. Uh, I think I know how to do I think I know how to fix this, though. So, um, device manager. Okay, so you can see in other devices it has USB blaster here unknown. That's really annoying because I thought when I installed the drivers that this would have installed. Uh, just right click on that. Update the driver. Uh, browse. Browse. Um, that should be in the installation for Altera. Cordless drivers. And you can see the USB blaster folders here, so it should uh, find it on its own. Okay, so I found it, and now it's going to install the driver. So this should work now. And now it's included in your uh, kind of known driver list. Okay, so now it's found it. Um, get it here. So it should appear here. And I'm not really sure why, but you need uh, JTAG plugged in um, for this USB blaster device. Um, it certainly doesn't seem like it's a JTAG connection, but it is, in fact, a JTAG. So, um, so it should be an output. Okay, so here's your SOS file that's, uh, that you use the flash. Grab that guy. Um, I think I'm all set. So just hit start. Mm. Okay. Okay, for some reason it worked the second time. And uh, so now I'm just going to take you to the board so you can see if it works or not. Okay, so I got the, uh, the program flash onto the board. Um, so it'd be a little hard to see. Okay, so I got propped up. And, um, so as I mentioned, these uh, bottom five switches, these uh, this one's going to be a select line, and these two, uh, these two are going to be input one and input two. Um, right now, the select line is low, and uh, also the green LEDs here, 
another run LED there on this side. So um, if I flip these switches, then um, the red LEDs will light up for the switches. Um, but I'll make one, so it's one, and then the other one where I'll just have both high. And so this is the select switch. So that means the multiplexer is taking this input and displaying it, uh, that, that input on these green LEDs. So if I just flip the select line, that takes uh, this input instead. So I can make this low, and then uh, that LED will go low. So now you can see with the select line here, uh, these green LEDs will match uh, these red ones. And uh, no matter what I do on this side, nothing will happen. But if I flip those select lines, then uh, this input passes through through the multiplexer. Okay, so that's kind of the Hello World tutorial of this Altera board. Uh, I hope this video is pretty useful for you. Uh, take care. In the previous two FPGA lesson videos, some of the FPGA applications I showed you were pretty boring and could easily be emulated with a microcontroller. However, the point of those videos are to give you most of the tools and concepts you need to move on to more advanced applications. This video will be an example of one of those applications. In this video, we will be building our very own single-channel oscilloscope that will auto-trigger on incoming UR messages. The design will also interpret the waveform concurrently and display the ASCII values on the seven-segment displays. Surprisingly, this won't be as difficult as you might think. We'll be using the Mercury FPGA combined with a new baseboard and an FPDI breakout board. Like the previous videos, we'll be covering a bunch of new concepts here. We'll learn how to interface to the analog to digital chip on the Mercury, interface to a VGA port, create a UR receive module, synchronize incoming and asynchronous protocols, create multiple processes in a single DHCL component, and finally, how to drive a seven-segment display. And I'm just going to start by creating a top-level design to create this oscilloscope application. The peripherals I'm using in this oscilloscope are the onboard button for reset, the clock 50 megahertz to synchronize everything, and the analog-to-digital converter IC located on the Mercury board. The analog-to-digital converter is going to hook up to the FPDI USB to UR breakout board, which is going to be connected to the computer. For the output, I have a VGA port and a seven-segment display port. So the two biggest components in this project are the analog-to-digital converter and the VGA component. Now for a big project like this, sometimes it's easier just to borrow someone else's code that they created to implement or drive this kind of functionality for you. And that's what I did with the VGA component of this project. For the VGA component, I chose a yet another VGA project created by Sandro Amato. And this is available on the Open Core's website. This Java project contains waveform generation that you can use and also some character mapping so you can also write characters to the VGA screen that you're connecting to. So with the original project, unfortunately I had to remove the character mapping stuff because it was too big for the Spartan 3A. After I removed everything, I was able to fit, but I also had a hard code to grid lines in, and I also spared the waveform generation functionality. So I'm going to put the derived module here. So here's the derived Java Java project that I added here to interface to the VGA monitor to drive the waveform functionality and just to get things to pop up on the screen in general. So let's do a quick black box analysis of what this module can do. For the input, you have the clock and reset. So the clock needs to connect to 50 megahertz, and reset's pretty, pretty obvious to just set the one to reset the module. Uh, these enable lines I've learned, you need to tie up to high in order to get this to run. And these four inputs here are how you interface the waveform functionality of the object. Now basically data is the y-axis and address is the x-axis. So at any given address, you write y data point. So pretend this is your VGA monitor. Address is going to determine how far along the x-axis you are, and data is going to plot where here is. So if you were to increase the address while you are increasing what you write the data, then you would just kind of get something like that, where you would start from the plot zero and to the other extreme. Now, when you want to write data to a specific address, you need to have the write enable high. So if you want to write data like 1F2E at address 300, you need to set you know, 1F2E here and then 300 here, but then you'd also need to raise write enable high. Otherwise, the data will never get saved to that address. And then the clock, after the clock, you can kind of drive that with whatever. Uh, ideally, you would synchronize this clock with the waveform, but in my experience, you can hook this right up to the same clock as here. Now, the output makes perfect sense because that just hooks up straight to the ETA port, which uses horizontal sync and vertical sync. I'm not going to go over the protocol of VGA because there's just so many tutorials online that cover this. So if you're interested in learning how the protocol works, then you can easily Google search that online. But just know that what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hook up the single red signal to all these reds, this green signal to all these greens, and this blue signal to these two blue signals. And uh, yeah, these are only one bit values. So you really only get three bit color or eight different colors with this setup. But that's made so it simplifies the application down. So that was a quick black box analysis of the Abaja, and now I'm just going to do the same type of analysis on the Mercury ADC. This Mercury ADC module is applied for Micronova, and you can get it on the resources page on their website. 
So what this module will do is that it interfaces with this ADC, which communicates through SPI. And then you can pass the channel that you want to read from. So ADC has eight different channels on it, so you can re read from eight different sources. So that's what this does. You can pick which one of those eight channels that you want to read from. So this N input has differential read or a single-ended read. Uh, if you want single-ended, you have to write the one. In this case, I'm going to use single-ended. Uh, trigger is what you use to pulse high to tell the Mercury ADC to begin a conversion with the ADC. So when you get a pulse high here, the Mercury with its SPI interface will talk to the onboard ADC IC and obtain the ADC reading for the channel that you specified. Now when it's done with this conversion, it'll put the result on D out here, and then also pulse out now. So this is actually a pretty perfect application for a register to hold whatever value comes out from here. So you can see I added the register here to receive the value of D out from the Mercury ADC. Now before I introduce the rest of the components, let's think about what we want to accomplish for a second. We want to build an oscilloscope that auto-triggers on the following edge of the first start bit of 9600 baud e-word signal. Then we want to display the entire waveform in a good proportion to the rest of the screen on a VGA computer monitor. Then when the waveform is captured, stop creating the waveform. So the logic is actually pretty simple. If the ADC here drops below a certain value, then start capturing, which means write zero into this address, then raise the write enable signal and record the data point. Then after a specific amount of time, increment the address to one, write a new data point to that address, and keep write enable high. After we capture the entire screen to address 800, then we stop. When we stop, then we want to wait for the next start bit. So I pretty much have my input interface here and my output interface here, and what I need to do is I need to bridge this input, this output in such a way to accomplish the oscilloscope application that I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill in everything all at once, and it's just going to be a little overwhelming at first, but I'll uh, kind of hold your hand through the explanation of it. So this is a significantly more cleaned up version of what I use to accomplish the oscilloscope application that you see in the example at the beginning of the video. Like I said before, this probably looks very overwhelming at first, but it's actually much easier than it looks. If we review what a UART signal looks like, you have this initial start bit. It starts off high, then you get the start bit, and then these are just arbitrary data bytes that could be any value. Then you have the stop bit, which is always one. So let's just kind of walk through the process of what happens when a UART signal is received. So we send some byte through the computer, through PuTTY or something, and it reaches the PDI, it converts it to UART. So we get this waveform that's then degenerated onto here, going to this ADC. Show you what the clock is. I have clock divide 86, which basically just is a clock divider that outputs a slower clock signal than the 50 megahertz clock. And you can see the output of this clock divider feeds straight into the trigger. So that means this Mercury ADC is constantly triggering over and over and over again. So what's happening is that it's constantly reading this input right here. You can see I'm hooked up to channel 4 here, which is the channel that I plugged in. Actually, channel 4 is wrong. This should be fine. I'm hooked up to channel 5. So I'm constantly reading channel 5, which that PDI is plugged into, and I'm getting a single-ended input. So that's all that I did with this Mercury ADC. So it's constantly sampling over and over and over again. It's constantly outputting a new value to this register. Now this register is hooked straight up to the data input into the object, but it also hooks up to this FSM logic analyzer. And all this thing does is it just looks at this value and waits for that drop. So when it sees that the ADC is at one value, but then it drops to the next value, then it just uses a simple go signal to say, okay, now we have a start bit, so let's start capturing. That's all that this thing does. So you could have some output coming from here, but then once it drops below a certain value, then it raises the go signal, which you can see connects to right enable, which makes sense because we want to start capturing. So if we raise right enable, then that means we're going to start capturing. But go also attaches to this count 80, 800 device, which all it does, this is actually a bit misleading because it actually counts from 100 to 800, and 100 to 800 is outputted here. So what happens when we receive the start bit, it will raise go high, so we'll see that goes high, so the address out counts from address 100 to address 800, and connects to here. Now all this does is, once it gets to 800, then it outputs stop, and then stop connects to here, and then the FSM sees that we reached 800, then it lowers go again, and that's when we stop. And you can also see the clock divider connects here. It drives kind of like the timing. So count 800 appropriately counts a defined rate that I want. I don't want it to capture the waveform too fast or too slow. I want it to capture a specific amount. So the clock div 86 module is a module that determines the rate at which I sample the Mercury ADC and record data points with the counter so that the 9600 UART waveform fits nicely on the screen. So how was the division of 86 chosen? Well, when the waveform is captured, I want it to be centered on the screen. So let's say this is my VGA monitor. When I capture the UART signal, I want it to be padded by 100 pixels on the left and 100 pixels on the right. So it fits nice and evenly. So start off high, and then there'll be the start bit, and then there'll just be whatever bits 
start to set over yours. So I kind of want it to look like that, where I start the data bits and stop it. So that's one reason why I start at address 100 on the counter module. And then I only want to sample this waveform fast enough where I approximately get the end of the stop bit at address 700. Because if I sample too slow, then the waveform is going to be really tight and condensed because it's just going to appear as a short amount of time. And if I'm too fast, then the waveform is going to be stretched out and then I might miss a component of the waveform. So it's important to figure out the correct sampling rate at which I want to grab this data so that way it fits nicely on the VGA monitor. So 9600 baud means that Intuitively, this is actually extremely important. I personally have been pretty badly burned by not using these sync 